Hello everyone, I am Bradley Soar, Associate Professor of Computer and Information Science at the College of DuPage in Glen Ellen, Illinois. This video today is basically homework five, uh, certain parts of it reviewed. And so we're going to look at conversion of data types and our cases here from C++ into x86 assembly. And then I'm going to discuss uh, one thought experiment that was part of your homework assignment as well. So uh, in a minute here, I'm going to talk about questions one through, I believe, eight or seven at least. OK, and then other other uh, videos discuss the other parts of this. So eight, nine and ten and eleven. You've already seen that in previous videos, so go find that video. And then uh, questions 12 and 13, I'm going to handle question 12 right here today. And then question 13 is just another example. If I took, a, took F, which is a float, turned it into a double, and then turned it back to a float, would that all that conversion equal the original value? That's what that question is asking. And some of you might have had other questions, and that's it's a good thing. You should, that is like a question you should spend a little time thinking of because as we'll see here when we go through this that if you end up like this x squared if you end up with bad data that's your fault I guess right like it's real easy to think that uh, you know x squared will never be the value you know will never be a value outside of the range I'm expecting to see but you'll see it's real easy to forget about that multiply two numbers together and break mathematics as we know it or at least on the computer science side mathematics side no but on the approximation on the computer science side of things yes we can break things and um, and the rest of the questions here question 14 and 15 and 16 17 18 19 and 20 those are all found in the book chapter 1 and the important part here is in your own words so those of you who just copy pasted everything good luck getting points on that because uh in your own words anybody can copy paste but but writing it out in your own words hopefully it makes you kind of internalize it a little more these are important questions not just you know they, they don't seem important but they actually are later on in your career you'll you'll kind of look back at this course because i did this 20 years ago and i look back at it too and i go i did learn it might have been tedious it might have been boring but i did learn things that uh, I needed to know, you know, those that subtle found those subtle foundational items that uh, help me be a better programmer. Okay, same going forward, like problem 21, that you can look up that truth table video that I created to look at those kind of things. And then this is just the same kind of question. Just uh, if I have five inputs, how many different combinations, how many different rows do I need for the truth table? Okay, so coming back here. I've created this handy dandy little chart for you. I've, I've stopped making it this, uh, I'm not trying to hide information from you guys, but, uh, but apparently this gets lost along the way. So I've created this chart. Uh, I believe it's in week five, weeks five, week five's lecture stuff now. And so now you can see that I have uh, eight different data types that I'm thinking of in C++. And so a character is one byte in C++, a short is two bytes, int is four, in our, on our architecture long is also four, and long long is eight bytes of storage. And so, and then float is four, bit, four bytes of storage, but, uh, and then double is eight, and long double is, is kind of tricky. Nobody really uses long, the actual long double that's sitting, you know, the, the stuff that's sitting on the the CPU sitting in the arithmetic logic unit for whatever reason, I'm not 100% sure, but we really don't have it. It's available to us, but we really don't do that. So float and double are pretty much all we use across the board uh, in mathematics or, in, you know, when we do the computer science side of things. Uh, float is good for games and things where we can kind of lose a little bit of precision but gain speed, but otherwise we supposed to, we use double for pretty much everything across the board. But if you want to get down to it in assembly language, you can access the, the actual long double uh, implementation on the, uh, on the CPU, on the ALU. So that now this, makes these, this chart makes these problems a little easier because an unsigned long long will be a Q word. So it's just unsigned is the de facto default type 
for x86, which is the opposite, right? A character, a short, an int, a long, a long, long, these are all signed by default, but by default in as x86, everything is unsigned. So unsigned long, long is just a straight up keyword. A double is a real eight. A short, that's signed, a signed short is S word. A long, long, which is, you know, that's a signed long, long, that's an SD word. Unsigned short, short that's unsigned is just a plain up word. Character, now, you know, say, like, I believe that by, you know, the definition of character in C++ is kind of left open. All the others, if you just say short, that's presumed to be signed, but I believe character, it depends on the implementation. Our implementation is showing that character is signed. So character will be S byte. Uh, float is real four, and then that pretty much covers it. So I could have asked, uh, what, how many different, 13 different questions here. And, and now as you move forward, we're only going to be using basically character, short, and int. We're really not going to get into long or long, long. We're going to keep everything to, you know, from eight bits up, eight and 16 and 32 bits when we're dealing with our data types. So you really only have to know six data types in our x86 language as we move forward in this course. So that covers that, and now let me show you, let's talk about the thought experiment here for answering questions, things like questions, um, not, uh, where are they? Uh, 12 and 13, and specifically question 12 here. Let's talk about that right. <laughs> let's talk about it right now. So let's take a look at this thought experiment here, you know, part of the homework assignment and uh, many students leave these blank, but these are important to understand that, you know, the answers to these questions so you can <laughs> not make these mistakes and introduce very subtle bugs into your program that only happen every so often and you can't really kind of, not easy to reproduce. So in this case, I have this question, x times x is x squared greater than or equal to zero for all values of each of the variable here of x, which is just an integer, a 32-bit integer, which ranges work and which don't. And so this question opens up a second question we'll get to in a second, but in mathematics, just pure mathematics, any number squared will get me, you know, will get me a positive value or zero, zero squared is zero. Any positive value times a positive value is positive, and any negative value times itself, negative, you know, negates out the negative, and you, res you know, end up with the result of a positive number. So in the real world, we would expect that this holds true for every value, not just 32-bit, but in mathematics, anti any integer value, any real value, any value, almost any value at all, right? I'm, who knows about complex? I don't know how that works with other types of numbers, but pretty much every number that we would work with is going to be true. This is going to be a true statement. And so as you can see here, and don't mind the code, the code just, it's pretty complicated just because I needed to make sure that this thing runs 4.29 billion times and the it's hard to get the, the for loop to work right because of the fact that it's hard to get the end condition. It's easy to get a beginning condition, but it's easy to infinite loop this thing. And all, I'm, and I'm really trying to get this thing to try every possible case for uh, the integer. So for all 4.29 billion different possibilities. But the first thing you see here is every three seconds, or you, oh my god, it's getting faster and faster here. Every one second or so, you're seeing that computer science math does not match up. We're proving it right here, right now computer science math does not match up with mathematics math because I would expect every value going through this thing of negative, 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 negative to always be positive, but you can see this thing going back and forth. X squared is going back and forth and back and forth between positive values and negative values, and absolutely none of these are the correct answer because negative two, 2 billion times negative 2 billion is a huge number. You know, it's, my goodness, right? This is, in, you know, what's a billion times a billion? It's something four times 10 to the, what, 12th? Or 24th? Well, whatever it is. Uh, I'm just spitballing it here, but you get the point. 
this should be a giant number, but it's not. Sometimes this number over here is smaller than the number over there, which makes no sense whatsoever if I'm multiplying giant numbers together. So at first glance, you go, okay, you know, like some of these values are correct or, or at least get me the result of is it at least greater than or equal to zero? And I go, no. But, like, but the next question is how many values? So let me undo the, it's the C outs that are causing all the, uh, all the delays here. So let me run this a little bit faster now. Now it's, just, now it's running through everything without printing anything. And so you'll see that it's roughly 50-50. It's not going to be perfect. It should take a couple more seconds here. And you'll see that it's the case where, yep, about 50-50. You can see it's, you know, 50, maybe, I don't, without going, 50.1% versus 49.99%. But, of course, we just discussed that this should be 100% true cases and 0% false cases. So then now that you understand that half the time, if you just pick a random integer that fits in 32 bits, half the time you'll get, a, you'll get the sign right, and half the time you won't. And, but then the next question is taking, not even taking that into account, well, how do I even get a right answer? Like how many times do I even get the right answer and what values are correct? So to answer that properly, let's just take a step back for a moment and just say I have a one digit number, nine, and I have a one digit number, nine, and I multiply them together and I get an 81, which is a two-digit number. And then, let's see, what is 99? Let me just get this right. Let me just get the calculator. 99 times 99 is 9801. So if I take 99 and I multiply it by 99, I get 9801. So in these cases, that first case, a one-digit number times a one-digit number gets me a two-digit number. A two-digit number times a two-digit number gets me a four-digit number. And the same thing goes in binary. And in this case, we're dealing with a 32-bit quantity. So the largest value that, I, that will work, just, just working the same thing out, is a 16-bit quantity. So if I take 65,535, and I multiply by 65,535, that's a 16, these are both the largest 16-bit 16, 16 quantities. So in binary, that would be, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, one, two, three, four, five, six, that number right there. So if I take those two numbers and I multiply them together, what do I get? I get exactly this number. Well, let me just. Okay, whoops, that ain't it. I just said copy, so what the heck? There we go. So you get 4,294,836,225. You don't get the absolute maximum because there's you know, still missing a few little things there. But you kind of get the point that, you say, like I say, a five-digit number times a five-digit number gets me a 10-digit number in base 10. And the same thing goes, let me, let me find out what that is in pure binary. Let me put that in and see what we get. You get this number out of the deal, okay? So again, as I'm saying, it's not the maximum integer, but this is the maximum number that you can put in that is a multiple or is, what is a value that is mul two values multiplied together. This is the largest that you can get. And so again, now anything larger than this, will cause it some kind of overflow because this will, you know, this will overflow and it'll lose those extra bits and that's where we're going to start getting into trouble. So the answer, and it, and it works since we're dealing with int, which is signed, uh, positive and negative, that this works from negative 65,535 negative 65, to positive 65,535. Any one of those values in that range multiplied by itself will get me a correct answer in the integer range, but anything outside of that will not. So that really reduces things, right? I mean, it just, it really, really does. And so that's where, you know, so that's just something to keep in mind that even for something like, you know, multiplication, 
a lot of times you have to think about what what is your end goal and you know what data types you're using like what's nice about python is that python will because it's a more of an interpreted language and it's a newer language it has all that big int stuff already incorporated in it so it'll do all this for us for free but any of these strongly typed you know strongly typed languages where i have to specifically yell out hey this is an int or hey this is a long long or a long or whatever you're going to get into trouble and that's not to say that you can't make a number that's even too big for Python. You can, it, but it's just one of those things that Python will automatically kind of upgrade your uh, data type to accommodate. So, but again, in C++, only from negative 65,535 to positive 65,535 will get you a correct result, like x squared that gets me the actual correct answer, but half the time, if all you care about is, is the sign correct, about half the time it's correct, and half the time it's not if you just picked a random number. So, okay, so again, keep these things in mind. And that's why I gave you a couple other problems to do, uh, to, you know, basically just to think these things out with floating point numbers and double type, you know, float versus double, shorts versus ints, and that kind of thing. You do need to worry about that kind of stuff. So that's all I wanted to cover in this video because everything else has been covered in previous videos. So you can go find those videos here on Blackboard through YouTube or whatever to get that information. So if I misspoke, if you know a better way to do things, I'd love to hear it. So email me at swordb at cod.edu if you have information or questions. Uh, or you can comment below as well and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. So thanks for sticking it out with me as always. Uh, now we're finally, finally moving on to real programming into x86 assembly language. So now the fun finally begins, all this tedious math. Now you'll understand why we're spending our time doing all this tedious math as we move forward into x86. So uh, thanks everybody for sticking it out. Have a great day. I, uh, I'll see you next time.